With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. On the first Sunday morning of each month, it has been our recent practice for me to introduce a month-long church-wide scripture memory verse. Your staff assisted me some years ago in identifying 48 of them, so obviously it would take us four years to preach all the way through this cycle of memory verses, and our practice is to simply repeat that cycle with a new sermon about an ancient, timeless, unchangeable truth. When I first introduced this series of Scripture memory verses, this is the one that we began with because this is a fundamental passage of Scripture dealing with the whole issue of Scripture It generally and certainly Scripture memory. We have no reason to memorize God's Word, to hide it in our hearts, unless we know, first of all, what the Bible is, how we got the Bible, and what the Bible can do for us. And all of that is wrapped up in this simple verse today that declares that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, I'm doing something different today as a preacher and a Bible teacher. I don't mean to shock any of you, but brace yourself, buckle your pew belt. I do not have a three-point alliterated outline. I know it's hard to believe. Shocking, indeed. But in years past, I have taught you from this verse and parallel passages that God's Word is inspired, it is infallible, it is inerrant. I've taught you in... Years past that this is a spotless book, a sovereign book, it's a sufficient book. We've talked about its accuracy and its authorship and its application. But today, I'm not going to give you a three-point message. I'm going to give you a 12-point outline. But don't worry too much. We're just going to move word by word and phrase by phrase. I want to demonstrate for you our church's belief in what is called the verbal inspiration of Scripture. And we'll talk more about that in the message. But every time that a faithful preacher preaches, he's moving word by word back through that passage. So if if it's a good Bible preacher, you're really never done with the text until the sermon is over. So don't close your Bible until we close the service. And that's true regardless of the homiletic outline that the preacher may use. But today I want to illustrate that point By simply moving word by word and phrase by phrase. Let's begin where the verse begins. That word all. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Notice that the text does not say some scripture. Or most scripture. Or almost all scripture. But all scripture. This speaks of what Bible students call the plenary inspiration of Scripture. Don't be afraid of big words. Your students go learn trigonometry at the high school. Don't be afraid of learning the word plenary. Would you say the word plenary? Plenary just means full, total, or complete. If you've ever gone to a conference, they have breakout sessions for this or that. They may have a plenary session. That's where everyone, where where all of the group comes back together. And the word plenary is just a word that speaks of the fact we believe that all of the Bible is inspired. When I was a boy, the preachers would say, we believe it all from the table of contents to the maps. And while we know that there are some things in our Bibles, like a study Bible, that are put there by men, suffice to say that we believe that from Genesis chapter 1 all the way through Revelation chapter 22, all of the Bible is the Word of God. All 66 books of the Bible are the Word of God. I said all 37 books of the Old Uh, Testament, or 39, and all 27 books of the New Testament, they are all the Word of God. Some years ago, Pastor Andy Stanley, you say, why do you call names? Because I want to warn you about false teachers in the world today. Several years ago, Pastor Andy Stanley said that as New Testament believers, we should unhitch ourselves from the pages of the Old Testament. I have many problems with that flawed doctrinal error, but I will just give you one reason. The New Testament affirms the Old Testament. If you're going to throw out the Old Testament and unhitch yourself from it, you are unhitching yourself from a significant portion of the New Testament. 
Jesus Christ believed in the full, total, complete, plenary inspiration of Scripture. He said of the Word of God that not a jot or a tittle would pass away until it had all been fulfilled. Now this week you probably didn't say anything about a jot or a tittle. But in the language that Jesus was referencing, we would say, not even the dotting of the I or the crossing of the T, not the smallest stroke of the smallest letter of the smallest word of the Word of God would pass away or fail until all of it was fulfilled. Pastor, do you think if Christ were here today that He would teach that all of the Bible is the Word of God? I think He would say that all the Bible is the Word of God. I think he would say that every book of all the Bible is the Word of God. I believe Jesus would say that all the chapters of all the books of all the Bible is the Word of God. I believe Jesus would say that all of the verses of all of the chapters of all of the books of all of the Bible were the Word of God. I think Jesus would say that all of the words of all of the verses of all of the chapters of all of the books of the Bible were the Word of God. Are you ahead of me? I think that Jesus would say that all of the letters of all of the words of all of the verses of all of the chapters of all of the books of all of the Bible are the Word of God. But it gets deeper because Jesus actually taught that all of the parts of all of the letters of all of the words of all of the verses of all of the chapters of all of the books of all of the Bible are the Word of God. Because if you know anything about the Hebrew language of the Old Testament, the Greek language of the New Testament, if you change a stroke of the letter, you change the letter. If you change the letter, you change the word. If you change the word, you change the verse. If you change the verse, you change the meaning. You have altered and adulterated the Word of God if you do not believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Pastor, you believe all of it? I believe all of it. When I was interviewed by this church to come on your staff, one of the deacons asked me about this very doctrine. And at one point he asked me, do you believe, this was Brother Bud Ricketson, by the way, asked me, do you believe that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish, commonly called the whale? I said, Brother Bud, if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the whale, I'd believe that. I'd want to ask the Lord about it when I got to heaven, but I'd believe it by faith. Think about it, dear Christian friend. If the Bible can't be trusted for history, how can you trust it for heaven? If the Bible can't be trusted to be accurate in the area of science, how can you trust it in the area of salvation? If you can't believe Genesis 1 and 2 and the doctrine of creation, how are you going to believe the book of Romans and the doctrine of conversion? Friend, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5 said, here's how sin entered into the world. It came in by one man. He was referencing Adam. Look right here. If you can't trust Romans chapter 5, verse 12, where he talks about sin and the original man, Adam, you might not be able to trust Romans 5, 8. And if we can doubt Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, we are in an eternal heck of trouble. All Scripture. I don't know if you know, but amen goes in that spot. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. But we we need to move on now. Not only all, but look at that next word, Scripture. That word Scripture literally means writings. In fact, in the preceding verse, Paul told Timothy that from childhood you have known the sacred writings. Uh, Sometimes translated, you have known the Holy Scriptures. And you don't have to be a linguist to look at the word Scripture and see the first six letters are the word script. And anytime you see the word script by itself or as a part of a word, it's speaking of something that has been written down. In our day, maybe even typed out. a, A manuscript, a transcript. If you write a letter... Sign your name and forget something, you put a P.S., a post script. Maybe you read a, uh, read a psalm, and there's some writing up above that psalm. It's called the super script. You go uh, take theater at school, and they will give you the script from the play. I'm not trying to talk down to you, but I, you need to see this word scripture speaks of something that has literally been written down. 
I didn't come today to pick on Andy Stanley, but when it comes to an accurate view of the Word of God, he's provided a lot of fodder in recent years. Most notably, he says that the first century church did not have a Bible. You don't understand the word Bible just means book. The idea that they did not have sacred writings to which they could appeal and upon which they could base their faith. Now to be clear, the first century church did not have what we have today as our Bible. The Bible was still being written at that time. But may I remind you, when Jesus was tempted of the devil in the wilderness, he did not say, it has been told. He did not say, for I have heard. What did he say, church? He said, it is written. Jesus spoke again about the jot and the tittle. He didn't say, not one concept will pass away. Not one thought will pass away. Not one idea or philosophy or ideology will pass away. He spoke of something that had been written down. A wonderful parallel passage you should seek to learn is in 2 Peter 1, verse 21. There Simon Peter says that no prophecy of Scripture, there's the word again, no prophecy that has been written down, was made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit, what are those last three words? Spoke from God. Do you see? No prophecy of Scripture. No prophecy that has been written down was was originated by man, but it's what was spoken by God. The apostles believed that in ancient times, God had spoken. And do you know what apostles and prophets did when God spoke? They wrote down what God said. Someone says, when I read the Bible, it's almost as if God himself is speaking to me. Wrong. When you read the Bible, it is God speaking to you. Outside with the Lord Jesus, who believed that there were sacred writings... In fact, in Matthew chapter 22, you remember one of the times they came to test and to trick Jesus. That They asked him a question about a woman who had been married and widowed seven times. The story, the analogy they used involved a, a, a man who had six brothers. There were seven total brothers and the oldest brother married this woman. And they said, Jesus, imagine these seven brothers and a woman marries the oldest one. He dies and she remarries the second oldest one. Then she outlives him. She marries the third oldest one all the way until she's married all seven brothers and outlived them all. And I just thought, man, if I was the baby brother, daddy, I ain't marrying this black widow. You had to find somebody else for her to get hitched up with. But Jesus, this woman, has outlived and outlasted all seven brothers. Here was the question. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And Jesus told them, you're making a mistake because you haven't studied your Bible well. People are not married or given in marriage in the resurrection. And then he made this statement that you'll note on the screen. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not, what's the next word? Have you not read what was spoken to you by God. Because God said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. By the way, when God said that in the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were dead. And God is saying, I still am their God. So he's he's the God of the living and not the dead. But I just want to point out what Jesus said in route to that teaching. Have you not read what was spoken by God. Now, that's not a mixed metaphor. But we would tend to ask, have you not read what was written? Or have you not heard what was spoken? But the sinless Son of God, the Master Teacher, who never made a mistake of any kind, including just a slip of the tongue in His teaching, said, have you not read what was spoken. The idea in time past, God spoke, someone heard it, and under divine inspiration, they wrote it down 
And when you read what they wrote that they heard, you're reading something that God has spoken in time past. What that means in our generation is that if you want to hear the audible voice of God, you don't need to get a book by Benny Hinn or Creflo Dollar. You don't need to tune in to TBN. You want to hear the audible voice of God? Read your Bible out loud. And if you want to have an experience with God, you don't need a book from Lifeway. Bury your nose in the blessed book of God with a commitment that you will submit your life to its authoritative teaching. Because when you do that, I mean, when you open up the Bible and sit down in front of it, you, look, watch, you are ingesting down into your soul a word that is quick and powerful. That is, it's living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. The writer of Hebrews said, it's piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I had this illustrated personally Friday night. I went up the road to the Mount Vernon Baptist Church across from the children's home in Baxley. And I was speaking at a men's conference. Friday night I was the second speaker. And by the time the first speaker got done, I was almost undone. He preached on the sin of anger. When he started... I did what a bunch of you do. Lord, I hope if there's some angry men in here, I pray you'll use this message to deal with them about their anger because I know your word says that we ought to be slow to speak and swift to hear and slow to wrath because the, the anger of man will never achieve the righteousness of God. I, a, amen. Boy, this is a good, timely message. By the time he was done, the word of God had cut me to the quick. Because it is alive. And you want an experience with God? Get a word like that down inside your soul. And submit to what it wants to do down in your life and in your heart. All Scripture. The next word is the word is. You say, preacher, you going to preach for a while on the word is? Sure am. You will notice that it's in this verse twice. And as you try to memorize this verse, that can be sort of an anchor point. Parents, as you teach this to your children, you may even as they try to learn it and quote it, emphasize that word is, because that will again just be sort of a mnemonic device anchoring your way learning this verse. I'll also point out while I'm mentioning some mnemonic devices that the word for, F-O-R, appears four times. In this verse. And that will also help you to remember. Two words is and four times you have the word for. But we need to think about that word is. It was in the late 90's. That then President Bill Clinton. Testified under oath that his guilt or innocence in the. You'll remember Monica Lewinsky. He said that his guilt or innocence really depended on what the meaning of the word Is is. And boy, did we ridicule him, and rightly so. He wasn't looking for a dictionary. He was looking for an excuse. But for all of the justified ridicule that he received, that does not mean, child of God, that the word is doesn't have a meaning. What does the word is mean? It is the present tense form of to be. The Bible does not say that it was the inspired Word of God. The Bible does not say of itself that one day it will be the inspired Word of God. But that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that it is profitable. Not that, listen now, not that it used to be profitable to grandma and grandpa's generation back when they believed that backwoods stuff. Not that it's going to be profitable one day when Christ returns and sets up his millennial kingdom on the earth. But right now, in everyday life, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. 
anything the Word of God ever was, it still is. And anything it is today, it forever will be. It, this word is, in this context, reminds us the Word of God is a settled word. Jude called it the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. It is as unchanging and as unchangeable as the divine author that inspired the text. Communists have banned it. Hollywood has blasphemed it. Liberals have belittled it, but it lives on. Hypocrites have betrayed it. Some have burned it. Everyone has broken it, but the Bible keeps on ising. Try to knock it down with liberal preaching and the Bible will not budge. Slap at it with the cockamamie ideas of men like Raphael Warnock, Joe Biden and others and it's not going to move a millimeter. Let the Hollywood bimbos and the airbrush starlets criticize the Word of God but the Bible says of itself that when the grass has withered and the flower thereof has faded away the Word of the living God will still stand forever and forever and forever. Now what that means, child of God, is if you're going to get in line with God you've got to get in alignment with this book because He's not changing His mind to come and agree with you about something contrary to this blessed Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for several things. All Scripture is. Let's look now at that next word, given. All Scripture is given. Now to be clear, the word given does not appear in the original Greek text. It's part of the translator's attempts to explain and translate a very difficult word that just literally means God breathed. That it has been given to man by the inspiration or the breath of God. But I want to highlight this word given just to illustrate that we do not believe that the Bible just descended from heaven in its current form. There are religious groups that teach that their sacred writings were just written by God and they descended to the earth in some kind of gold tablet form and all their leaders had to do was go out to the appointed designated place and dig it up out of the earth. No, we believe that God inspired His Word and He gave it through a process. He gave it through human instrumentation. 66 books of the Bible written by 40 different authors living on multiple continents over a period of 1,600 years. And when I say 1,600 years, I do not mean the 1611 King James translation of the Bible. I mean the 1,600 years between the writings of Moses and around 1,500 B.C. all the way to the end of the first century, the writing of the book of the Revelation, the closing of the canon of Scripture. And despite the different people, the different languages, the different cultures, the different contexts, and even the different time periods. Everything they wrote down was the perfect Word of God. Turning again to 2 Peter 1.21, no prophecy of Scripture was ever made by an act of human will, but look at this, but men, not angels, not seraphs or cherubim, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. What this means, among other things, is that the Holy Spirit did not violate or in any way nullify the the characteristic and personality of the human writer. You say, preacher, what has that got to do with anything? Well, when your teenagers go off to college and some liberal professor, even at some so-called Baptist institutions, tell them that you can tell that Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and that you can tell from language writing tendencies that John wrote the gospel of John, they will say, therefore, it's obviously the writing of men and not the writing of God. God is, listen friend, God is well able to move on the heart and the hand and the mind of these men so that they can write within their own personality and writing style exactly what God wanted them to write down. All Scripture is given. Well, how exactly did did God do that? Well, the next phrase, by inspiration. The language here literally means God breathed. By the Spirit, the in-spirit, the inspiration, 
God breathed out His Word into the hearts of His human messengers. God breathed it out. Man wrote it down. For one final time, I want to call your attention to 2 Peter 1.21. No prophecy of Scripture was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That word moved, moved by the Holy Spirit, is a nautical term. It was used to describe wind filling up the sails of a sailboat and propelling that vessel across the surface of the water. And in the same way that wind would blow a sailboat, the Bible says the Holy Spirit of God, watch this now, breathed out the Word of God into the hearts and minds of the men that wrote it down. How did we get that Word from the mind of God into our hands today? By inspiration. God breathed it out. Let's look at the next two words. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is not the word of the preacher. It's not the word of the Baptist or the deacon or the church. By the way, that takes the pressure off me as a preacher. I'm chief flunky and bottle washer. I'm middle management. I'm nothing but the messenger. I'm the mailman. So don't get upset with me for the news that I'm delivering from the king. I'm just a herald. This is not Mike's word. It's the word of God. By the way, that means, listen to me now. You have zero obligation to believe or try to practice anything that I preach if I cannot show it to you in the Word of God. Don't be a man follower. Don't take my word for it. Be like a Berean in the book of Acts. Study behind me during the week to see, does the Bible support what Pastor Mike said? And if the Bible supports what I have said... Follow it. Put it into practice to the glory of God. If the Bible does not lovingly come and confront me, and regardless of how I respond, you have no obligation to embrace or follow anything that I cannot show you in the Word of God. Let the church say amen. That also means that you have no freedom to reject anything that I tell you if I can show it to you in the Word of God because it's not me saying it's me telling you what God said in the Scripture for all Scripture has been given by inspiration of God. I do want to show you 2 Peter 1, 21, one additional time. That no prophecy of Scripture was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That's why a synonym for the Bible is the Word of God. It is indeed the very Word of God. The psalmist said, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How can a young man cleanse his way? By keeping it according to your word. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. The unanimous cry of the writers of the Bible is that it is indeed the word of God. Hezekiah called the scripture the law of the Lord. He said it's the testimony of the mouth of God. Peter said it was the sword of the spirit, the word of God. The writer of Hebrews said it was the Word of God. And Peter said, do you know how you were saved? You weren't saved by the message of the preacher. You were saved by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. But now let's move on to the next word. It's the word and. We believe that every word of God is inspired, including this word, and. Preacher, you going to preach for a while on the word, and? Yep. Because here, the word, and, is like a divine hinge upon which the two halves of this verse swing. The first half of the verse is really talking about what the Bible is. It's the inspired word of God. It's the distillation of the breath of God. That's what it is. But that's not all. There's an and. The second half of the verse tells you what the Bible does. That it's profitable to do some things. This is the connection between what we would call orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Right belief and right behavior. 
I have encountered many Christians through the years, and at times I have to plead guilty myself. We will affirm the first half of the verse. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. We'll, we'll put on our Sunday morning voice, Amen, Amen, and Amen. The Word of God. But we're not nearly as quick to submit to the authority of the second half of the verse. It does no practical good to affirm that the Bible is the Word of God if you will not yield to its authority and benefit from its profitability in the areas of doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Jesus never divorced right belief from right behavior. In fact, He rebuked two different crowds because one had right belief but not right behavior. Another one had right behavior but their heart wasn't right. To one crowd, he quoted from Isaiah and said, You worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Your behavior is right, but your mind is wrong. To another crowd, he said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say do? You're saying the right stuff, but you're not doing the right stuff. This word and reminds us, and I would encourage you, when you memorize this verse, you ought to emphasize that word and. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And. That, in other words, that's not all. There's more to what the Bible says about itself, and it is profitable. Let's look at that next phrase, that it is profitable. And we've already looked at the word is, but profitable means that it'll benefit you. It will do you some good. By the way, we're saying that all of the Bible will do you some good. Yeah. Not just the parts you like. Not just the parts you already know. Not just the parts that make you comfortable. Not just the parts you already agree with. Hey friend, if you want somebody to stand up and tell you all the time, repeat for you stuff you've already said and that you already believe, go to the pet store and buy you a parakeet. But the Bible will do you some good and all of it will do you some good. The well-worn parts of the Bible will do you some good. Those clean white pages of the Bible, like the part we'll study tonight in the book of Judges, you probably never in your life heard a sermon on the verses I'm going to preach tonight in the book of Judges. But I'll tell you this in advance, regardless of how good or poor the sermon is, that passage of God's Word will do you some good. Why do we emphasize that you ought to go to Sunday school? Is it because we want to run up the numbers in the church? We don't even publicize the numbers. No, it's because we know it'll do you some good. It's for the same reason you tell your kids to eat their vegetables and brush their teeth. You know it'll do you some good. Why do we emphasize and challenge you to be back for the evening service? It's because we know that the Word of God will do you some good. You say, how much? Good. A whole lot better than whatever it is you're going to binge on Netflix all afternoon. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It will help you and strengthen you, edify you, and grow you. Well, how is it profitable? Four simple phrases conclude this verse. Beginning with the idea of four doctrines. By the way, when I've tried to memorize this verse in times past, it's the second half of the verse that always trips me up. And several years ago when we memorized this passage, I gave you a little mnemonic device. I called it Dr. Kai. Uh, I asked you to imagine you go over to the Waycross Hospital, you need to see a cardiologist, and Dr. Smith is not available, Dr. Jenkins is not available, but Dr. Kai can see you. D-R-C-I. Doctrine, reproof, Correction, instruction. And over the years, literally dozens of people have told me that that little device helps them remember the things that, that the Scripture is profitable for. Beginning with for doctrine. Your Bible may render that word as teaching, that the Bible is profitable for doctrine or for teaching. Now, in many contexts, the word doctrine has become an ugly word. Preacher, don't focus so much on doctrine. Doctrine divides. Yes. Yes. Yes, doctrine divides. 
Doctrine divides truth from error. Doctrine serves as a plumb line. Doctrine serves as a chalk line. Doctrine serves as a level. Doctrine serves as a measuring stick to tell you if you've got two belief systems and they are incompatible with each other, they may both be wrong, but they can't both be right. How do I determine that? I lay the measuring stick of the Bible up beside it and see does it line up with the Bible because the Bible will divide fact from fiction, right from wrong, truth from error, and light from darkness. Acts 2.42 says the early church devoted themselves steadfastly to the apostles' doctrine. Now I want all the parents with children in your home to listen to me very carefully. Because there is an epidemic that is plaguing the modern American church. And it's not called COVID-19. It is the deadly epidemic of letting our children decide where the family will go to church. Typically based on atmosphere, environment, style... Aesthetics. Let me ask you a question. If your child had a brain tumor and there were two brain surgeons you could go to, you going to let your eight-year-old determine which one of them you're going to pick because they like the color in his office better? If you do, you're too dumb to come in out of the rain. And I'm talking about something that is eternally more important than even our own physical health. Daddy, I'm calling on you. Decide, plant your feet in a Bible-believing church and say, as long as they preach and practice the Word, this is where we're going to stay. But now, if they stop preaching and practicing the Word, we're going to be some of the first ones out the door because the most important thing in selecting a church is not the programs or the music or the building or whether you like the way the pastor dresses or parts his hair. The, The most important thing is what do they teach? Doctrine. You'd be better off with a boring preacher who's so dull you need to drink a case of Red Bull before you come to church than to have a slick silver tongue bamboozle you by compromising the Word of God and leading you off into false teaching. The Bible will teach you what's right. It will, it's profitable for doctrine. But it's also profitable for reproof. Now, if doctrine tells you what's right, reproof tells you what's not right. It was Dr. Warren Wiersbe in his wonderful commentary on this verse said of these four phrases, doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction. Dr. Wiersbe said, the Bible will tell you what's right, what's not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. Doctrine, what's right? Reproof, what's not right? The NIV translates this word, reproof, as Rebuke. Now, I don't know anybody that likes to be rebuked. If you like to rebuke people, you've got a spiritual problem. And if you say you like being rebuked, I don't believe you. Nobody likes to be told that they're wrong. Now, mature people are willing to be shown that they're wrong. But nobody likes to be told that they're wrong. In fact, your first response from your flesh when somebody tells you that you're wrong is to to get a mirror and try to turn it around on them. No, I'm not wrong. You're the one that's wrong. And part of the reason you're wrong is because you dared to come tell me that I'm wrong. But the Bible will just flat tell you that you're not right. It will tell you that your belief system isn't right. By the way, lean lean in close and listen. You do not have a right to a doctrinal belief that is contrary to the Word of God. When you come to a passage of Scripture that, that would correct your doctrinal position, you've got a divine obligation to change your view to come up under the authority of the Word of God. The Bible will tell you some of your beliefs are not right. It will reprove and rebuke you. The Bible will also tell you some of your attitudes are not right. 
But this reproving work of the Scripture telling you that something's not right is not limited to you doing something wrong that you got to be disciplined over. Sometimes, I had this happen just this week. Sometimes the reproving work of God through His Word is rep- reproving you for believing a lie of the devil. You walk through a season in your life, you think God... I don't think God cares. The Word of God will rebuke that. And the Word of God will rebuke that by saying, Jesus said, come unto me all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Word of God will rebuke that lie by saying, cast all your cares on me for I care for you. When you think that you are alone in that circumstance... The Word of God will rebuke that lie by saying, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. When you feel like God is not helping and assisting you, the Word of God, hidden down in the heart, will rise up and reprove you and say, Your God is, he is a sword and a shield. He is your glory. He is the lifter of your head. Don't you believe that lie of the devil? That's not right. The Bible is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. And then there is the word correction. Now in this context, the word correction speaks not, of, not merely of pointing out that something is wrong, but it speaks of how the Bible will take you by the hand and show you what is right. Aren't you grateful that our great physician doesn't just give a diagnosis, he also writes a prescription, and in grace, he'll even dispense it for you. (laughs) He'll tell you what's right, he'll tell you what's not right, but boy, praise the Lord, he'll tell you how to get right. He'll say, what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're believing is not right because this is the truth, but here's what you need to do. Correction. One last phrase. The Bible is profitable for instruction in righteousness. For instruction or training in righteousness. The word here is primarily used to describe training a child. In the New Testament, this word primarily appears, ironically, in Hebrews chapter 12, where we've been for a few weeks and will be for a few weeks more. It speaks of the training of a child, showing them the right way to go. It is also an agricultural term that speaks of setting up a trellis that you might train the young tendrils of a vine, the direction that you want them to go. In our modern day, we would use this word to describe what happens when we plant a new tree out in the front yard. You've either planted a landscaping tree or you've been by a new subdivision. They put out these Bradford pear trees or something similar. And because you've got it where you want it to be, You don't want it to move. You know it is susceptible to the winds that are going to blow. So what does the arborist do? He gets some twine, some type of cord, and stakes that tree off in three, maybe four different directions. Because it's already in the right place and I want it to stay there. That's what this word means. That's why Dr. Wearsby says what's right, what's not right, how to get right, and and how to stay right. Once you get your doctrine and your practice corrected, if you live in submission to the Word of God, let me tell you how it will profit you. It will keep you on that right path. Because it's told you what's right, not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. Let me illustrate this with a couple of examples. Sit very still and listen carefully. Take, for example, the sin of sexual immorality. When I put this example in my notes, I really felt the Spirit of God prompt me to ask you a question. Is that example describing you? I mean literally, sir, are you being unfaithful to your wife? Ma'am, are you being unfaithful to your husband? Unmarried person? Teenager? Are you engaged in sexual sin? I didn't come today to beat you up. I came to profit you. 
And you know how the Bible will help you and do you some good in sexual sin? First of all, it'll tell you what's right. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 14, do not commit adultery. Here's, here's the standard. This is what's right. The Bible will also rebuke you and reprove you and tell you what's not right. Maybe by quoting to you Hebrews 13, 4, that marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Then the Bible will tell you how to get right. Maybe by 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. <laughs> In that relationship, get out of that situation because this is right, you're not doing right, so get in a different circumstance. Flee. And then in grace, the Bible tells you how to stay right. Genesis 2, 24, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. And if, and if you'll keep doing that, you'll stay right. <laughs> what about the sin of lying? Could there be a little boy or a little girl listening to Pastor Mike today, and you've been lying to your parents? Could there be some teenagers lying to their siblings? Lying to their friends? Boasting? Fish tales? The Word of God knows how to deal with those who would lie. Doctrine. Well, in Exodus chapter 20, it will remind you that, that what's right is do not bear false witness. It will remind you what's not right by taking you to Revelation 21 verse 8 and tell you that all liars shall have their place in the lake of fire. What that means if you are comfortable, systematically, constantly, continually lying, you're not saved. The Word of God will tell you how to make it right. Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are His delight. How do you correct that? Stop lying and start telling the truth. How do you stay right? Well, the Word of God will train you in righteousness. Ephesians 4, 25. Put away falsehood and speak every man truth to his neighbor. How does that happen? It happens because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, where Pastor Mike Stone is committed to walking you verse by verse through the books of the Bible. You can contact us through our church website at ebchurch.net or visit pastormikestone.com. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of the Emmanuel Pulpit.